Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joseph Kearney, and it is a great privilege for me as Dean of Marquette University Law School to welcome you to our annual Bowdoin Lecture. Let me begin with a word or two about the individual in whose memory this lecture stands, Robert F. Bowden, a Marquette lawyer from our class of 1952, who served as Dean of the Law School from 1965 until his untimely death in 1984. I have come to know a bit about him, maybe even a good deal, from some of you for whom Dean Bowden was variously a professor, a colleague on the faculty, or simply a fellow member of the Wisconsin legal community. And whether we knew Bob Bowden personally or not, the latter being true of most of us, it is quite clear that he sought excellence as a lawyer, as a professor actively engaged in teaching and writing, and as dean. So it is to honor and perpetuate Dean Bowden's memory that the law school in the mid-1990s created this annual lecture. Through it, we each year bring to the law school a distinguished academic who will discuss with us facts, doctrine, philosophy, or any number of other things that, as Bob Bowden well appreciated, inform the law. It is our great good fortune for this year's Bowden Lecture to have with us Heather Gerken, the J. Skelly Wright Professor at Yale Law School. Before joining the Yale faculty in 2006, Professor Gerken was a tenured member of the Harvard Law School faculty. Going back further in time, she practiced law at Jenner and Block in Washington, D.C., and served as a law clerk, first for Judge Stephen Reinhardt of the Ninth Circuit, and then for Justice David Souter of the United States Supreme Court. In her professional work, Professor Gerken specializes in constitutional law and election law. She practices what she preaches, if you will, serving as a senior legal advisor for the Obama for America campaign in 2008 and 2012. Yet she is careful not to associate her academic and advocacy roles, and Professor Gerken is probably about equally likely to interest or correlatively to disappoint both the left and the right in her scholarship. Uh, in all events, it is as a law professor that she comes to us today to talk with us of dark money and the future of political parties, the real problem with Citizens United. So please join me in welcoming this year's Bowdoin Lecture, Professor Heather Thank you very much. So it's an honor to be here. I, I want to thank Marquette and the organizers of the Bowdoin Lecture, and especially the Dean for inviting me here today. It, it is an honor to deliver a lecture named after such an illustrious dean. And it's an honor to receive, am I doing this? Uh, and it's an honor to receive uh, the invitation from, from such a wonderful dean who is not just distinguished in his own right, but is someone known in the legal world for his integrity and decency, even back in the days when we clerked together uh, and we were in somewhat different chambers. Joe held the respect of every clerk every clerk in the building, not, no matter their politics. And it's been especially lovely to watch him for the last 24 hours. And there's an old saw uh, in um, campaign circles that says that, that you campaign in, in poetry, but you govern in prose. And the thing that's magical about Joe is that he seamlessly moves from poetry to prose in whatever he's doing. So when he's talking about his students or his faculty or the Marquette mission, it's all poetry. Uh, and yet, he is the person who instructed me that this, this talk should be 43 minutes long uh, and, a, uh, and, and that we would all be in the room by 4.34. Uh, so um, today I want to offer a little bit of food for thought, uh, not a fully worked out theory, uh, but a series of observations about the current state of campaign finance law and its long-term effects on American politics. So let me just start by telling you what I'm not going to say. I am not going to tell you the near ubiquitous tale that reformers, reporters, and even a good number of academics tell about the current state of affairs. That story, one that you all know well, is that Citizens United ushered in a new era of dark money with wealthy corporations spending wildly, saturating the airwaves, taking over American politics, and all the while with no one able to, to trace that money and where it's coming from. The story is that the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United has caused a sea change in American politics, and that the court's overturning of a case called Austin, the much revered case in which the court upheld campaign finance regulation in order to promote equality, 
that that was the modern day equivalent of Plessy versus Ferguson. Now, much of that story is wrong, and some of it is actually nonsense. And I say that not as someone who is against campaign finance regulation, but as someone who believes in it, someone who believes in the important role that law plays in structuring politics. I say that as someone who believes that there is a bigger story about the effects of Citizens United on our political system. It is just not the one that the media and the reformers are telling. So today I will argue that the so-called dark money trend may be a symptom of a deeper shift taking place in the structure of our political process. And is one that Citizens United helped bring about. Citizens United is certainly not the but-for cause. It's just one link in the causal chain. And its effects on 2012 and the future is nothing like what we read in the newspaper. So let me give you a quick overview of where we are going. I'm going to make because lawyers always make three points, never two, never four. So first, I'm going to try to debunk the conventional wisdom about Citizens United and identify what I think of as the real reason that Citizens United is important. It was important because of what it said about in this independent spending, corporate or otherwise, and its relationship to corruption. And we're about to do a quick... Might be me, I might be magnetic or something. Citizens United was important because the, it, it has shifted the way that elections are run in this country, but it has very little to do with corporate spending or even uh, concealing the sources of money. So call this section the real problem with Citizens United. Second, I'm going to talk about what everyone is worried about right now, the so-called dark money trend. But I'm going to say something quite different from what most people say about it. And here, I don't think the conventional wisdom is wrong. I think that the dark money trend matters for reasons that you can all intuit. It's not good to have large amounts of money swishing around the system with it all being untraceable. But the conventional wisdom may be missing something more fundamental, more important. My fear is that the dark money trend is a symptom of a deeper shift taking place in American politics as we move from the political parties we know to a system dominated by powerful groups acting outside of the formal party structure. Put succinctly, my worry isn't so much about dark money, but about shadow parties. And if you want to call this section the where will Jim Messina work in 2020 section. And I'll just say Marquette is really a fantastic place to talk about this trend because one of the most vivid examples of what I'm calling the shadow party comes from Wisconsin's own history. I'll talk a little bit about that history and the cutting edge political science and then talk about how I think it relates to the current law. Finally, I'll explain why I'm so worried about the emergence of the shadow parties. I'll talk about what I think to be the deeply honorable and deeply important role that the party faithful, the foot soldiers of our democracy, play in the system. So you can call this section in praise of the crazies or why the everyday citizens who care about politics are what may ultimately be politics saving grace. So let me turn to the first point, the real problem with Citizens United. Now, I'll confess that whenever I talk about campaign finance, I always get questions about whether the Supreme Court and Citizens United is to blame for the current state of affairs in campaign finance. Or I should say more precisely, I get extremely long speeches about why the Supreme Court and Citizens United is to blame for everything going on in campaign finance. Citizens United, I am told, unleashed the corporate floodgates and ensured that wealthy corporations are playing an outsized role in our democracy. And they're able to do so using dark money, that is, money that's untraceable through the system. If your worry about Citizens United is a worry about corporate dollars, however, you shouldn't just blame Citizens United. In fact, you shouldn't just blame the Supreme Court. And to understand why, I think it's helpful to know just a little bit about campaign finance law. So here is the tale we tell in the Academy about campaign finance law. In the beginning, Congress created the Federal Election Campaign Act, and we saw that it was good. And into this campaign finance garden of Eden, Eden came the snake in the form of the Supreme Court's decision in a case called Buckley versus Vallejo. There, the Supreme Court famously drew a distinction between contributions, which is the money you give a campaign, and expenditures, the money that someone spends on a campaign. On the court's view, expenditures are closely tied to cherished First Amendment activities, and that's very hard to regulate, let alone cap. Contributions, on the other hand, the money you give directly to a politician, raised weaker First Amendment concerns and thus would be subject to more regulation and thus would be impossible to cap. So you can see the problem immediately. Congress intended to regulate both sides of the money politics equation, capping the money that went into the system in the form of contributions and capping the money that came out of it in the form of expenditures. By lifting the cap on expenditures but leaving in place the cap on contributions, the Supreme Court created a world 
in which politicians' appetite for money would be limitless, but their ability to get it would not. Two of my colleagues analogize it to giving fat, hungry politicians access to an all-you-can-eat financial buffet, but insisting that they can only serve themselves with a teaspoon. So we all know what happened. Just what you would expect to happen when the means to obtain money is limited, but the desire to obtain it is not. Political interests inevitably looked for loopholes. They inevitably drove big trucks of money through those loopholes. There was a soft money loophole. When that got closed, people began to use issue ads to bypass existing rules. Then came the 527s and swift voting. That was the Kerry campaign. The 527s have now been displaced by words you hear all the time, the super PACs, the 501s, C4s, and C6s. As a result of Buckley versus Vallejo, the entire reform game becomes focused on closing these loopholes, engaging in what I think of as the regulatory equivalent of whack-a-ball. The dilemma is obvious. Either money gets driven into dark corners, so it's unregulable, or efforts to regulate it start to press very hard on First Amendment values. Now, to be fair, there are some people that think Buckley versus Vallejo was not the real problem. Many reformers think that the real fault lies with the current court, that McCain-Feingold, the most recent sweeping campaign finance reform, was going to work in the long term if the court hadn't started slicing it to pieces. And here, I think the reformers have a point. It is not the point that they are constantly flogging with the press, that Citizens United unleashed the floodgates of corporate speech, but it is, uh, it is, I think, true that Citizens United was in some sense a pivot point in campaign finance doctrine, not because of what it said about corporations, but what it said about a different word that begins with C, corruption. Now, to understand why the ruling on corporate expenditures matters less than the ruling on corruption, it helps to know a little bit of background. First, the floodgates of corporate spending were open well before Citizens United. Due to an earlier Supreme Court decision called Wisconsin Right to Life, thus again confirming that Wisconsin is the center of the political universe, <laughs> certain kinds of corporate and union ads were constitutionally protected as long as they were phrased carefully. And here's where the lawyers come in. You just had to be sure those ads didn't explicitly encourage you to vote for or against a candidate. All Citizens United did on this front was to eliminate the need to phrase those ads carefully. It basically put the lawyers out of work. So to give you a very crude example, a Citizens United, before Citizens United, a corporation could run an ad saying, Senator X kicks puppies. Call Senator X and tell him to stop kicking puppies. And after Citizens United, a corporation could run an ad that says, Senator X kicks puppies. Don't vote for the puppy-kicking senator. Moreover, Citizens United is not the reason why money is often hard to trace back to donors nowadays. In fact, in another section of the opinion that almost no one talks about, the Supreme Court ruled eight to one that transparency was constitutional, that, that you could have disclosure and disclaimer rules about spending. The dark money trend, the fact that we can't trace this money, is entirely due to the fact that Congress and the FEC have failed to regulate when they ought to have. And I guess it doesn't surprise you that Congress failed to regulate here, because it turns out Congress is failing to regulate everywhere. Um, it makes it very hard to teach constitutional law nowadays, because when you talk about the separation of powers, you have to say to the students, once upon a time, Congress used to pass laws. <laughs> but it's also true of the FEC. So the FEC was, was built to be a divided agency, three Democrats and three Republicans, and it turned out it, success, it succeeded in being a divided agency and almost gets nothing done as well. Now here's the other reason that reporters and reformists tell us that Citizens United was a disaster. It's because it overruled a case called Austin, the one Supreme Court case, the one Supreme Court case that held that equality was a good reason to have campaign finance regulation. Now, for those of you who aren't lawyers, that might seem very strange because equality seems really the natural reason to have campaign finance regulation. But in the world of the First Amendment, this was considered to be impermissible for the most part. And there was only one Supreme Court decision that allowed it. Citizens United overruled Austin. And I'll have a re little bit of um, thought about whether that mattered or not. But I'll just say this. To me, it wasn't the ruling on Austin. It wasn't the ruling on corporate speech. It was important, in fact, for reasons that reformers don't actually want you to know. And that's because Citizens United substantially cut back on the power that Congress has to regulate in this area. And I'll just say to you, it is that part of the opinion, not the part about corporations or the part about equality, which is reshaping the campaign finance land landscape. So any of you who's a first-year law student, you know that when Congress regulates in an area protected by the First Amendment, it has to have a good reason to do so. And Citizens United seems to have cut back pretty dramatically on the reasons that, that Congress can regulate. 
That's because it substantially narrowed the definition of corruption, which is regularly invoked whenever Congress wants to pass reform. Indeed, while reformers mourned the court's rejection of Austin and the equality rationale, the truth is the most important line in Citizens United was not the one overruling Austin. It was this one, quote, ingratiation and access are not corruption. So why was that important? For many years before Citizens United, the court had gradually expanded the corruption rationale well beyond its origins, which used to be quid pro quo corruption. I give you money, you give me a vote. The court had licensed Congress to regulate even when the threat was simply that large donors had better access to politicians, or the politicians had become, and I quote the court, too compliant with their wishes. Indeed, at times the court went so far as to say that even the mere appearance of undue influence or the public's, quote, cynical assumption that large donors call the tune. That was enough to justify regulation. Before Citizens United, in other words, ingratiation and in access were corruption, as far as the court was concerned. And this extremely broad and loose definition of corruption was easy to satisfy and easy to invoke when you were regulating in this area. What this meant in practice was you could get everything you could have gotten out of Austin and the equality rationale without ever having to use the word equality. But Justice Kennedy isn't a fool. He was well aware of what his liberal colleagues were doing with the corruption rationale, and he did everything he could in Citizens United to put a stop to it. Kennedy didn't say that he, the court was overruling these cases, but that is just what he was doing. Now, Citizens United raised important questions about independent spending with this ruling on corruption. That is, the spending that is done by individuals and associations that is not done in direct, direct cooperation with the candidate or party. It's basically the money you see now being spent supposedly independently by outside groups. That's the money spent by a lot of super PACs. That's the money spent by Carl Rove's Crossroads GPS. That's the money that Justice Kennedy told us does not corrupt, which means that's the money that neither Congress nor the FEC can regulate heavily going forward. That holding has nothing to do with the status of corporations or the nature of corporate speech or equality. It has everything to do with the means by which corporations and wealthy individuals can spend their money. In my view, that part of the opinion doesn't just raise questions about regulations on independent corporate expenditures, which is what was the ruling was about. It raises questions about lots of other types of campaign finance regulation, which was made evident as lower court decision after lower court decision following Citizens United began to knock down many other pieces of the campaign finance system. It may even put the soft money ban or even public financing at risk. Citizens United matters then, not because it opened the corporate floodgates. They were already open to any well-advised corporation. Citizens United mattered because of what it said about independent spending and corruption. And we've already seen a lot of evidence of why that was a problem. As I said, these lower court decisions came down, and over time, they basically deregulated independent spending. That's why we have super PACs and 501c4s and c6s that are so hard to regulate now. That's why everyone is worried about independent spending, the efforts of millionaires and billionaires to spend their money during elections, separate and apart from the candidate. Now, again, to be fair, we can't lay the blame for all of this at the feet of the court, because, again, Congress and the FEC have failed to regulate. So that is the first point. And thus far, I will say it is heavily supported by the evidence. There's been a lot more independent money swishing around in 2012 than in prior years. And much of that money involved independent expenditures. But that money, as far as we can tell, hasn't actually signaled a big uptick in corporate spending. The share of corporate spending looks roughly the same, as far as we know. And it's not hard to guess why. Corporations don't particularly like to spend on elections. They learned the lesson of Target in Minnesota when they backed a, a, conservative, camp, a conservative candidate for governor and ended up with a consumer boycott. Even, cons even corporations that don't have customers who can boycott them don't really like to spend money on elections because they worry about something very simple, which is the shakedown. They worry that they end up having to give to both sides of, of the issue. So that's my first uh, point, that the dark money uh, and, and, uh, and worry about corporate spending is not really the central problem with Citizens United. But here I want to come to my second point, which is why you should worry about it. And why you should worry about it not just because there's a lot more money in the system and it's harder to trace. So you may remember in 2008 that the Obama campaign had about $800 million. That was more money than any campaign in history the last time around. And I remember a political scientist claiming at the time that Obama had more money than God, although I'm not really sure how we would measure that. Um, but the independent groups uh, that are spending in 2012 had a great deal more money than Obama and apparently than God. 
It's very hard to measure, but estimates put that number well over a billion dollars. That's billion with a B. And as I said, a lot of that money cannot be traced to its ori origins. Now, we worry when very wealthy individuals can secretly spend giant amounts of cash to support their candidates, and I won't rehash those worries here. But I'll just say that as much as I worry about dark money, I worry more about shadow parties. I worry that the dark money trend is just a symptom of a deeper trend in campaign finance. It's a point that is less about the amount of money that's being spent as about how it's being spent. It's a point that's less about, about, about money and more about power and where power is moving. So we may see a trend that might well extend well beyond 2012. So the worry is not shadow money, it's dark money, it's shadow parties. And let me talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Um, and here I want to just acknowledge, because you can't have footnotes flashing behind uh, your screen, that some of this work is based on a really bright uh, law professor named Michael Kang. So what is the relationship between money and politics in this cycle? What we are seeing is something painfully too familiar to anyone who studies it, which is called the hydraulics of campaign finance reform. It's a very simple idea, right? Campaign finance regulations do not reduce money's influence on politics, but simply force it to find different outlets. And you can see how the dynamic works. Party donors, whose contributions were limited, uh, turned to soft money. When the soft money loophole got closed, the money found its way out through another outlet, and we had the 527s. 527s morphed into super PACs and 501c4s. We even see it on the lobbying side of the equation. As soon as lobbying regulations in D.C. got any bite to them, lobbyists began to deregister and became consultants. So the money is still there. It's just traveling down different legal cha challenges, channels. So this may be the depressing lesson of campaign finance, about the hydraulics of campaign finance reform. Regulations don't necessarily reduce the amount of money in the system. They are just as like to, likely to shift the money into different channels. And that, I think, is what most people believe in the field is happening now. In fact, that's what most of my people, the people in my field, predicted would happen in 2012. But many of those who predicted this dynamic missed something really crucial about 2012. They worried that in 2012, the money would move away from the parties into structures uh, that were completely independent of the parties. So the idea was, you know, the crazy millionaire spends his money, steps on the campaign's idea, um, and uh, steps on the campaign's message and causes all sorts of problems in the system. Um, this is actually not what happened in 2012, and I want to talk a little bit about what that means. So let me just say one thing. I think that the way to understand what happened in 2012 is, is that while the amount of money has shifted out of the formal party structure, it is not being controlled by independent millionaires and billionaires. In fact, the parties are still in control of where the money is. So what do I mean by that? If the money is being spent by outside groups and funded by outsiders, by definition, it can't be controlled by the parties, right? Um, so how is it possible for me to say that the parties really are controlling this money? And here, this is where I draw on Michael King's argument, although it was written a decade ago and not about this. Michael King argues that the claim about the hydraulics of campaign finance reform is actually wrong. He says that they mistakenly identify what's just a symptom of a deeper trend, which is the hydraulics of political power. It's not money that has a hydraulic force. It's power, political energy, political eat, elite. The failure of campaign finance regulation is just the visible example of the ways in which legal regulation can redirect but not eliminate political energy and political power. So to understand this argument, just start with a very basic point. Political parties are not a thing, like a table or a chair. They are not stable legal entities. They're a loose collection of, of interests gathered to get together to compete with the other side and get a set of policies into place. They can thus take different form as circumstances dictate. That means that parties are incredibly hard to regulate. They are shapeshifters. Each time the courts or a legislator tries to regulate a particular type of political institution, political entrepreneurs find new outlets to channel their energies, new institutions to occupy, new means of exercising power. So the best known example in political science is the McGovern Fraser, or McGovern Fraser reforms. And let me apologize here if there are any political scientists in the room for retelling what has become sort of a bedtime story for their graduate students. So here's the story. In the wake of the 1968 Democratic Nominating Convention, the Democratic Party substantially reformed the nominating process. Now, we now think of conventions as something akin to a coronation, which is just a chance to sell your candidate to the public. But it's not the moment when the decision gets made. But for those of you who are too young to remember, conventions used to be the moment when you actually chose the standard bearer. There really were smoke-filled rooms, and the nominating process was entirely in the control of the party bosses. So the reforms had one purpose, to take away the power from the party elites 
and give it to the party members. It was the party elites versus the party faithful, the leadership of the party versus the party's ground troops, the people who knock on doors and drive people to polling places and root as passionately for their party as many do for their teams. And thus was born the nominating process we know today with elections and a fair amount of transparency and with a selection turned in a vote with broad participation during the primaries by party members. Now for a long time, political scientists thought that the mcgovern Fraser reforms meant the end of the party bosses, the end of political elites. But it turns out the empire always strikes back. It turns out that party elites still manage to exercise a substantial amount of control over the nominating process despite the absolutely fundamental structural change that McGovern Fraser introduced. So how'd they do it? It turns out the party elites still exercise a lot of power over the primary process. In fact, over the last decades, almost every single presidential candidate nominated by either party has been the candidate favored by the party elites. Now, the Democrats, you'll be surprised to learn, are slightly more fractious, um, but the Republicans have been virtually in lockstep with their party leader leaders. 2008 was actually the outlier in this respect. It was only in recent elections, in fact, where both candidates were not chosen by the elites. Now, John McCain may look to you like a traditional GOP candidate, but he was loathed by party insiders because he was perceived as disloyal. And Hillary Clinton was, without question, the choice of party elites, at least at the beginning of the cycle. Remember the superdelegates? The superdelegates are the party elites, and they had all put their, put their votes behind Clinton. So how is it the elites managed to do it? They have no formal power to choose, and yet they choose. They don't have enough votes, and yet their votes matter more than anyone else's. It happens through what political scientists call the invisible primary. If you watch a presidential race closely, you'll notice that before a single vote is cast, there are a seemingly endless array of endorsements. The infamous superdelegate controversy just scratches the surface. So what elites are doing, in essence, is signaling to each other who they want. Money, support, and boots on the ground come with those endorsements. And with money, support, and boots on the ground come votes. Hence, the rather astonishing success of the political elites. It's not foolproof, but it has a very uh, strong record of success. Now, the invisible primary is just one example of the hydraulics of party power, the way that shutting down one outlet for power leads another to be forced open. Another example is Wisconsin during the first half of the 20th century. And it's a vivid example of the way that political shape-shifting takes place. So Wisconsin had imposed, good governance state that it is, some significant and powerful limits on political parties. It limited their ability to electioneer and to make endorsements, to raise money. Formal party, political parties couldn't do a lot of things um, except for deal mostly with the nomination process. So what did the party elites do? They shapeshifted. They looked to what are called statewide voluntary committees, which interestingly enough had been cre created mostly by dissidents in the party. And those non-party organizations proved incredibly enticing to those who headed up the party organization. Political elites abandoned the official party structure for those private statewide voluntary committees that supported the party. And that's how they did all the electioneering and fundraising they needed to do, by being private associations. And just as the Supreme Court and Citizens United blessed independent spending as independent from parties and candidates, and thus protected by the First Amendment, so too the Wisconsin Supreme Court blessed voluntary committees as independent from the formal party candidates and thus protected by the First Amendment. The hydraulics of party power work just as you'd expect. With one outlet for power, the formal party was being closed. Power found another outlet. It found a shadow party. And as the power of the voluntary committees grew, they became the de facto parties in Wisconsin politics. The shadow parties, in short, became more important than the parties themselves. Now, the Wisconsin example strikes me as quite salient today because before this cycle, the conventional wisdom, as I said, was that the money would be raised and, put in, and pushed into darker places. People even thought at some point that the incumbents would put a stop to independent spending. Why would they put a stop to it? Because they would worry about millionaires funding swift boat ads and stepping on the campaign's message, sending the wrong signal, muddling the election. And so at some point, people thought the incumbents would actually put a stop to independent spending to make sure that they controlled the money. But that is not what happened. Instead, independent spending during 2012 has been done almost entirely by those with extremely close ties to the party. Despite the fact that spending is supposed to be genuinely independent, there is an astonishingly close connection between the big money players in this area and the party elites. So there's a great paper by one of my favorite political scientists, Seth Maskett, showing how these connections work for 527s. So in that paper, he and his co-authors actually just try to graph 
the, the connections by the people who run the independent 527s and the central party elites. And the connections are so deep and persuasive that the, the, the diagram looks a lot like a rat's nest. Most of the super PACs are run by people who used to run the candidate's campaign. That was true of the most serious GOP candidates during the primary. It was true of both presidential campaigns. And the same seems to be true of the nonprofits as well. So Carl Rove runs Crossroads GPS. This is someone who went from being a deputy chief of staff and campaign insider for George Bush to running an incredibly powerful and wealthy nonprofit that has dropped huge amounts of money in the presidential races and other races. It's not just the staff members that tie the super PACs to the candidates and the party. And here I will just turn to the brilliance of the comedian Stephen Colbert. In my view, Stephen Colbert has single-handedly done more for campaign finance reform in, this, you know, in the United States than anyone in the 20th century except for Richard Nixon. So he has done a great deal to explain to American citizens how campaign finance actually works. So he did a wonderful skit with his lawyer, Trevor Potter, who's a friend of mine and looks very much like a lawyer should look, very serious and straight faced. And he had Trevor, his lawyer, represent both Colbert's campaign, Colbert and Colbert's super PAC at the same time. He even put the leaders of both the campaign and the super PAC on the same conference call through his lawyer so they could talk strategy. The only problem with Colbert's running joke about the deep connections that run between super PACs and their candidates is that it's just too accurate to be funny. He's playing it straight. The reality is the farce. The comedy is the tragedy. Because while there is no common sense definition of a coordination that would allow for what we see today, the legal definition of coordination allows an inordinate amount of coordination. So super PACs have used the same footage or subjects and advertisements as the campaigns they are supporting, sometimes obtaining the footage from the campaign itself. So there's a great moment when, when close campaign observers figured out that Rick Perry's campaign was sharing footage because the ad for a super PAC had, had film that was just too good to be run by anyone else. Super PACs even share the same office. My favorite example is in Alexandria, Virginia. Companies working for both Romney's super PAC and his campaign, the two totally independent groups that are not coordinated with each other. They were in exactly the same suites in an office building in Alexandria, Virginia. Better yet, the founder of one of the companies was married to a deputy campaign manager for the Romney campaign, who conveniently enough also runs a consulting firm that is housed, guess it, guess it, in the same suite. Um, now, the couple insists that they never share information with each other, ever. The husband, temporarily cursed with self-awareness, did at least admit that the arrangement looks, quote unquote, ridiculous. Um, but returning to Ferdinand the bull mode, he also insisted that he and his wife never talked about these things and cheerily claimed that the third company in the suite, one that works for Romney, Super PAC, as well as Carl Rose Crossroads, that one was very separate from the other companies because, you know, there was a conference room situated between them. Now, it's not just the employees in these organizations that are closely tied to each other. It's the top-tier leadership, the campaign leadership, even sometimes the candidates themselves have begun to attend Super PAC events and fundraisers, while donors and operators of the Super PACs consult with party officials on a regular basis. My favorite example during the Republican primary of non-coordination was when Newt Gingrich told his own Super PAC to stop running certain advertisements, and they did. Now, I should emphasize I'm not implying that these arrangements are illegal. It's startling that we label these organizations as independent, but it's not necessarily illegal given the lax rules that exist. I'm concerned, however, with a different question. What the emergence of these independent organizations means for the political parties and the way that politics is structured. And here I come to the third and final point. The answer may be that the emergence of these independent organizations means nothing. And I think it's sometimes important for academics to be able to acknowledge the fact that we don't always know what's going to happen next. It wasn't long ago, I will say, when academics were wringing their hands over the weakness of the parties, their lack of unity, their lack of distinctive brand. And now it's just the opposite. Every academic has turned around 180 degrees and has joined the hue and cry over powerful united parties with deeply polarized identities. So any academic who tells you he knows what's going to happen in the wild and woolly world of politics is probably not an academic worth paying attention to. Moreover, we're dealing with shapeshifters here. Change is necessarily part of the equation. Still, if there's anything to worry about in the trends that we see today, it's about the direction that money and power um, are flowing in American politics. And this is what keeps me up at night. Where is G Jim Messina, Obama's mad genius of a campaign uh, manager, 
Where is he going to work in 2020? Now, I don't mean to be asking the obvious question whether Messina himself will be working for a campaign, whether he'll have a job. I'm not really worried about Jim Messina's fate. I'm worried about the Jim Messina's of the world and whether they'll be working inside the formal party structure or outside of it. Will they be working inside the Democratic and Republican parties or inside the shadow parties, the independent organizations that have quickly become such a powerful force in American politics? My worry is that in the ongoing and ever-present battle between the party elite and the party faithful, the leadership and the membership, that the independent groups may shift the balance of power between the two. And that possibility, I think, is something worth thinking about. In my view, the super PACs and the nonprofits have started to function a lot like shadow parties. They raise money. They push candidates and issues. Their leadership is often the mirror image of the campaigns themselves. The crucial difference between the super PACs and the nonprofits on the one hand and the political parties on the other is the way that money flows. If you're raising money for a party, you have to do it in small chunks with incredibly burdensome disclosure rules. If you're raising money for one of these other organizations, you often have no disclosure rules at all, and you can raise it in extremely large chunks of money. And that means a very different uh, strategy for raising money and a very different base for, for raising money. Now, let's talk a little bit of first about why this might not matter. To be fair, the parties have oftentimes split their functions. They've often taken many different forms without jeopardizing what the party is. So sometimes the parties contract out the get out the vote um, work that to independent organizations. Um, sometimes the Democrats do that, sometimes the Republicans do it. So it's possible to imagine that these independent organizations will just be appendages. They'll just be fundraising machines that allow parties to vastly exceed the limits we've imposed on them. It's also impossible to imagine, I will just say, the super PACs becoming parties themselves or these 501c4s becoming parties themselves because they lack the one thing that parties always have, which is the shorthand. The phrase Democrat or Republican is like the good housekeeping civil, a seal of approval. It's a shorthand for voters. It's how they know who to vote. So I'm not suggesting that a third party is going to emerge in any way. I'm just worried that the shadow parties are going to emerge. Um, and here's why I think that we might sort of worry, might worry about this problem. If you think that one of the things that parties do is generate coalitions, shape debates, uh, create bargains among interest groups so that you can govern in the end, there are a bunch of important things that the party does. The party doesn't just fuel politics. It isn't just the conversational entrepreneurs that, that fuel national debates, but it's also the way that we get through governance. A lot hinges on what the, the, what the, what the parties do. And my worry is that what if all those discussions suddenly move into the independent groups and outside the formal party structure? So again, the nonprofits and super PACs already do the things that parties do. They're institutions where elites can bargain and strike compromises, drive debates, frame issues, sell candidates. If these groups were something that existed separate and apart from the candidates, you wouldn't worry, right? Because you still need candidates to run in these things. But these guys are integrated substantially with the candidates. They basically have everything that a party has except for one thing, and that is the party faith. Um, so you can imagine a world that is emerging where the super PACs and the, the nonprofits have all the most important party elites, all the money, all the work that's going on for moving forward the campaign, and in the other room, in the formal party structure, what's left of it, you have the party faithful. Um, the everyday people who are passionate about politics, the ones who do the groundwork, the arms and legs of any campaign. You can call them politics ground troops. You can call them partisan hacks. You can call them crazy, although in my class that's a term of art and very complimentary. I call the party faithful the most glorious creatures in American politics. And even as these shadow parties start to grow, I worry that the, the party faithful are going to be stuck in the shell of the, the, shell of the party that's left and the, all the money and energy goes into the super PACs and, and nonprofits. So what happens if the center of gravity sh shifts? What happens if elites run the shadow parties and the party faithful are left by themselves in the shell of the formal party structure? What happens if what really matters in politics is what's happening in the shadow party, not the formal party? So let me just give you a crude example to show why you might worry about this. And going, this goes back to the Jim Messinas of the world. Politico ran a rather extraordinary story in the fall of 2012, I don't know if any of you caught it, when Romney was behind in the polls. And the Politico suggested that the Romney campaign didn't have enough money to make it through to November. And it was ask, asking itself, um, given how much Romney was depending at that moment on outside spending, Politico asked the question whether Karl Rove would continue to use his massive war chest in support of Romney. Politico asked just a simple question. What happens if Karl Rove decides to cut Romney off? Now imagine you want to be a player in GOP politics. Where do you want to work? 
Do you want to work for Romney's campaign or Rove's? Do you want to be in Romney's formal party structure or do you want to be in Rove's shadow party? I mean, if you're thinking about where the elites want to be, just think about salaries. Jim Messina, who's often thought to be a mad genius in politics in the wake of the Obama 2012 campaign, I think he made something like $90,000 a year. If he had been working for a super PAC or one of these nonprofit, it is clear he would have made hundreds of thousands of dollars, perhaps even more. So what happens if we hold the formal parties to strict contribution limits and disclosure rules while allowing the shadow parties to raise money in an unlimited way, perhaps even without disclosure? Independent is a big share of the market. What happens when it gets even bigger? Where are the gym machines of the world going to work? Now, again, it's possible that it won't matter. It's possible that these organizations will just be a means of evading campaign finance rules, which is bad enough as it is, but maybe that's all that will happen. The parties will just have a bigger pool of money to play with. But it's also possible that the center of gravity shifts, and we'll see a bipartite world with elites and big donors occupying one institution, wielding enormous power by virtue of their money, and the party faithful occupying the other. And I would worry about that state of affairs because I have a romanticized view about the party faithful. I think of them as one of the sole people in the country capable of keeping the party elites honest. So there's long been this conundrum in politics. Given that no individual voter has the time to monitor every representative and every vote that representative casts, how does the principal, the voter, control the agent, the candidate? And a lot of people have often said that the parties are the ones that do that for voters. They enforce party discipline, they punish defectors, they reward loyalists, they keep the brand distinctive. But then, of course, you begin to wonder, well, who is going to guard the guardians? Who ensures that the parties do right by the voters? Who ensures that the party elites just don't create a set of bargains that would be unacceptable if voters were able to pay attention and see what was going on? And I think that the one possible answer to who will guard the guardians is the party faithful. Because they are the bridge between the elites and the voters, between the party and the people. They provide an institutional check on the bargains that elites can strike, some break on how many principles will get compromised along the way. Now, the party faithful are often political realists. They understand that compromise needs to get made, but they also believe in something. That's why they are the party faithful. Now, if you have faith in the party faithful, you might prefer a world in which party elites and party faithful are under one roof, where they interact regularly, where they have time to develop bonds, where they are tied together by the networks that naturally spring up inside an institution, where they have to sort out their differences in the fashion that they have in the past. Now, of course, you could be very cynical, and you could say, well, why does it matter if party leaders interact regularly with the party faithful? Aren't donors already, to quote the Supreme Court, calling the tune? Will it really matter if the party leaders are only talking to the money side of the equation? Will it really matter if they cease to interact with democracy's foot soldiers? And if you look only at formal channels of power and influence, you might think it won't matter at all where the party faithful are housed and where the party elite are housed. But if you pay attention to what we know about how influence actually works in practice, you might think that having politics generals live in the same tent and the same base as politics foot soldiers really matters. Formal structures and formal power matters, of course, but informal networks, day-to-day -day interactions, peer pressure, these matter too. The sociology and social psychology of institutions makes clear a lesson known to every parent, especially one who's kids like Justin Bieber, peers matter, peer pressure matters. We all do our best to influence our kids, but we also know that their peers are a profound influence on them. We're social creatures. It's natural to take our cues from the people around us. And that simple lesson holds true within institutions and seems like, just as likely to hold true for political institutions as every other one. Commanders who interact regularly with the troops act differently from commanders who give orders exclusively from the operations center. And so too you might think that the party elites who talk only to candidates, interest groups, and donors will think differently than the party elites who work on the same floor as the party faithful, who get their coffee from the same coffee maker, who share takeout on the many light nights that campaigning involves. If you have faith in the party faithful, in short, you might worry about shadow parties because they ensure that the faith, party faithful are no longer interacting regularly with the party elites. If you have faith in the party faithful, you worry about the emergence of a dual system, a party and a shadow party. You worry that it will reduce the party faithful's most important form of influence, the informal form of influence they ex exercise by virtue of being part of the same organization. Big donors and big dinners interests have always played an outsized role in politics, but until now, one important access point 
for the everyday concerns of everyday people has been the everyday people who work for campaigns. And what happens when that access point gets eliminated? So I promised then with a bit of uh, romanticism, political romanticism, um, and a little bit of hedging for those of you who have the outline for CLE. So here's the hedging first. Politics is an ever-changing, unbelievably dynamic force, and few things stay stable for long. But I want to stick with my romantic point as well, which is that we shouldn't lose track of the partisan hacks. Politics foot shoulders, the worthiest and most honorable participants in the party structure, which is the party faithful. What I've been, um, while I've been among those who are worried about driving money outside the parties, my bigger worry has become that we're driving power outside of the parties, turning the parties into shell organizations whose utility to the candidate is little more than the good housekeeping, housekeeping seal of approval, the shorthand that they provide. We may be creating a world where the party elites talk to the moneyed interests and the party faithful talk to the rest of us. The informal social network that once provided a bridge between those two worlds may be dismantled. And as someone who places great faith in the party faithful and hopes very much they will continue to wield the power that they do, I worry about what Citizens United has done to American politics. It's hard to see how the party faithful will continue to wield the influence that I think they ought to wield if the power of the shadow parties begins to exceed the power of the real ones. Thank you very much. Is that it? I was told 42 minutes. Thank you. That was terrific. We have time for a number of questions. So what I'd like to do is to recognize people. And if you could keep your question as brief as possible, and then Professor Gerken will be able to speak with it. If you are seated in the lower bowl, as they say, press the button or have the person sitting next to you press the button and hold it so that we can hear your question. Please go ahead. Sure. So for those of you who couldn't hear, the question is, uh, what is the impact of ALEC and the, the impact it's having on legislation? And, and this is actually mining one of my other many obsessions, uh, which is in constitutional law about federalism. So ALEC, for those of you who don't know, is an organization that basically pushes uh, legislation through state legislators. Um, they're basically lobbyists. And like all lobbyists, um, they provide legislation in sort of a prepackaged form. I call it MIC legislation. Right? So they give you MIC legislation and MIC talking points and a little special party treat with, with polling to go along with it um, and stories to prompt reporters. It's a really incredible service that they provide for politicians. And it turns out to be an incredibly uh, important force at, at the state legislative level, particularly as state legislators have lost a lot of staff. Um, so state legislators depend on organizations like ALEC to figure out what legislation to pass. But because ALEC is so heavily supported by moneyed interests, and it's not quite a shadow party, but it is one of the incredibly powerful interest groups that plays uh, at the state level. Um, and because of the difficulty in tracing money, it's hard to know where the money's coming from and how they're doing it. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. Can you press the button and hold it down? Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, your argument largely rests upon a tenant that the shadow parties will never be populated or will not So it's a really good question. It's just hard to see where their entree point is going to be. Um, so, so the way that the formal party structure works nowadays is that national parties are quite integrated with state and local parties. Um, and that's the, that's the transmission network by, work, by which they bring in volunteers and so on. It's also to say it's their recruiting mechanism. So you know, if I ask my students, uh, my students are all junkies of, of politics. They all take election law with me. And if I ask them why they are working for someone, they don't usually tell me, you know, I've always wanted to work for. Crossroads GPS. No, that's not what they. They've always wanted to work for a party, right? One of they, they, they identify with a party. It, it's like rooting for a team. Um, uh, it's as it's powerful an emotional tie as it is uh, an intellectual one. And I don't think the, that the shadow parties will ever get that. I'd be very surprised that they would. So I can't see any other entree because why else would you bring in the the foot soldiers, right? You can just make the. It's much much easier to make the deals with the foot soldiers not present. Um, it's much easier to sort of house them separately. So it's, it's just hard for me to imagine that they'll, they'll have an entree point to come in. Thank you. Yes, please. Can you press the button? Just hold it down. Uh, uh, Professor, uh, Hegel said that every action has a reaction to it. Can you perhaps look to the future and 
tell us what reaction there might be to this dark money? Yeah. Before we end it? Yeah. So I, um, so I will, as I, as I said before, the, sort of pun, the, the academics once thought that the reaction would be to shut down this money because they thought it would move outside of the control of the candidates. And the, the one thing incumbents agree on, um, other than the fact that they should all be reelected, uh, is, is that they agree on they like to control the money. Um, people don't like to have the money outside of their control. And so there were these moments in the Kerry campaign, the Kerry campaign when there was this worry that these independent organizations were sort of muddling up the message of each campaign. And so people thought maybe they'll be react, re, that would be the action, the reaction would be regulation. I actually don't think there's enough friction in the system right now to prompt uh, a reaction by, the, by incumbents. And for a simple reason, right now they can have their cake and eat it too. So every, every incumbent is going to want to have their own super PAC, generating huge amounts of money for them to, to, um, to run their campaigns. And as long as the incumbents are united in having that interest, as long as they maintain pretty firm control over the money, I think there's unlikely to be much push for regulation. So what might lead us to start to regulate the shadow parties? Well, one thing would be if one party gets spanked um, and, and loses on the money front so badly that they'd make that their cause for reform. So this is, I, not to make you all unduly cynical, but mostly campaign finance reform is not passed um, by people who just want to make the world a better place. I know, I know that since you guys, are, you guys are from Wisconsin, so in fact most, almost everything in Wisconsin is done for a good reason, but in other parts of the country, people are not so nice. Um, so uh, oftentimes you have to find a reason that one party or the other is interested in passing um, campaign finance and has the position to do it. Um, and so sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. It's, it's hard to see it happening in the short term because if, if I thought, right now the Democrats think they're losing on the, on the money race, but my bet is that they'll do what always happens in politics, they will catch up by 2016. And um, if there's a Hillary Clinton campaign, my guess is there's gonna be a fair amount of um, uh, independent money supporting her. So as long as the race continues and one side doesn't feel like it's consistently losing it, it's hard to see an incentive for regulation. Thank you, please, can you press the button? Thank you, the bottom of it. Oh. How does the Tea Party fit into this rubric of yours? You know, it's so funny. I was just talking to a, a political scientist today, one of your own uh, today, and, and I was saying, you know, what, how do we, are the, are the Tea Party or is the party faithful? He insisted the Tea Party is a state of mind. Uh, so I'm not really quite sure what it means, but it's such a good phrase, I'm going to steal it at some point. Um, uh, so the, I take the Tea Party to be, in some ways, the struggle that I was just describing to you. So in every party, there is a fight between the party faithful and the party elite. Um, and I think the Tea Party is one form of that fight because um, they are trying to redirect the kind of deals that the party elites are making. And they're doing it in a really, I mean, interesting and unusual way uh, by mounting primary challenges. So usually the rule in parties is that you have your fights, you know, behind, it's like with your kids, right? You don't fight in front of your kids. You have your fights inside behind the closed doors of the party, but you don't bring them out and air your dirty laundry in public. But the Tea Partiers are running primary challenges. And primary challenges, that, that is a betrayal in politics. Um, and so what they're doing is running these challenges and it's been incredibly effective. I will just say that I think that much of the shift rightward that we've seen in the Republican Party largely stems from fear of Tea Party challenges. McCain's uh, shift uh, to the right um, came right after the primary challenge. You see a bunch of candidates now who are deeply worried about primary challenges. Some people think um, that Olympia Snow retired for fear. She was clearly going to win the main general election, but she may have retired because of a, the fear of a primary challenge. So they're a very effective group, and they found a way in the political structure to use power in a way that mostly the party faithful just generally don't do because it's thought to be disloyal. We have time for a number of more questions. Um, all the way in the back, if you can just say it. Loudly enough, Daniel. Uh, that's a so really great question. Just in case folks didn't hear it, the question is the McCutcheon versus FEC case, which is pending before the court to be argued tomorrow. Yeah, I think. It, I think and it whether mind. you will be so bold as to just say <laughs> a prediction. <laughs> See, now I'm on screen. Every <laughs> time I, I predict something when someone is taping, I get the prediction wrong, um, which is my father constantly reminds me during Bush v. Gore on national television, I said things like, it'll just take a couple days to resolve this. <laughs> you know, 
the Supreme Court won't grant cert on this. Um, the equal protection argument has no legs, although I'll, I will stick on that one. I actually think the equal protection argument still doesn't have any legs. Um, Seven to two. Yeah. <laughs> um, with my boss, I'll note. Yeah. So, so, so McCutcheon, for those of you who don't know what McCutcheon is, McCutcheon is a challenge uh, to co the contribution side of the equation. So remember I told you in Buckley versus Vallejo, they split these. And for a long time, the fight has really been about expenditures. McCutcheon says that you can't cap the number of, in the aggregate, of donations you give. So right now you can give a certain amount to a candidate. Um, Kearney for Dean, right? Like I, I gave him a certain amount, but, but I can't give money to every decanal candidate in the country. Um, so there's just some, some cap on the amount that you can give overall. And so McCutcheon says that violates his First Amendment rights. He should be able to give to every candidate. He should give, be able to give to every party committee, um, which would vastly increase the amount of money that you could spend on every election cycle, moving from you know, roughly $120,000, $325,000 to um, easily over a million dollars. So it, it would be, so it, it would actually, if you wanted to sort of know what, what could um, help the parties in that sense, it could help the parties tremendously, because if you can raise money in those giant amounts, you don't need your shadow parties, although knowing parties, they're going to want both of them, just so they can raise even more money for themselves. So that being said, it's hard to root for it. Um, and the reason it's hard to root for it is twofold. Right now, we have the regulatory equivalent of the Wild West in independent spending. You know, almost no regulation, huge amounts of money flowing through, very hard to trace. It's hard to want to see more of that. Um, it's hard to want to see every single foundation of campaign finance erode. Because I think that most of us think that, that the question isn't about whether or not campaign finance loses ground in McCutcheon. The question is how much ground does it lose? And the court could well say something that would destabilize everything, that would get rid of all regulation. And that would, that would be a big loss. And it's hard to root for that. So um, I'll just say that, yes, I'm worried about the shadow parties. And, and I'd like to see a solution. But I'm not sure the solution is to blow everything apart. Um, it strikes me as a little bit uh, too, too uh, elaborate a solution. So we have time for one or two more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, John. Um, is there a parable about governance in your argument? Because a lot of what you described with the, with the party structure is also a structure of relationships, communicative habits, uh, uh, mutually implicated lives. And so if, if that disappears, is that, is that, is, would, would that be a direction that your argument would take us, that, that in fact some of the governance crises we're facing now uh, are an unintended consequence of this. Oh, that's really interesting. So I had not actually thought to, uh, to think about the relationship to this to governance. I've been mostly focusing on, on the campaigns. But I, I suppose that in the same ways that, that it would raise the same sorts of questions in an ongoing way. Because one of the things that you notice about the party faithful is that they only turn out when they're happy. And um, people have a, you know, they, they're only going to give you boots on the ground when they, they feel good about what's going on. And, and, and in some ways, pa patronage. I mean, patronage, if, I don't have to tell the dean who's from Chicago. Uh, but the patronage, pa patronage is one way that the party elites and the party faithful stay very connected in governance. Um, it may not be pleasant, but it does work uh, in terms of politics. And so I, I suppose that you could even imagine it going forward. I, I will say the one part where I do spend time on these, uh, these networks is in the governance of election administration. And I am convinced that, that the future of election administration depends entirely upon a network of people with a set of professional, shared professional norms and goals that works exactly like I'm describing, that that's the, the best way to guarantee a good election system going forward. I think we, there was one question in the back. We'll take that, and then we'll go ahead. It's a good question. I mean, so uh, the, the one slippage I'll just note, the lawyer and me can't help note, the, they represent potentially millions of Americans. They also represent potentially the three people who gave money to them. And so that's, that is the central worry in campaign finance. I accept the equality rationale myself. I mean, it's not what the Supreme Court thinks is, is the right reason for campaign finance, but I think it is the reason why we care about campaign finance, that we, we have one person, one vote, but we don't have one dollar one voter. Um, and I think that if you take that concern in, in any way um, seriously, 
then you start to worry about massive organizations that can spend massive amounts of money during politics. It definitely regulates core political speech. There's no question that it raises First Amendment questions, and I don't want to deny them or put them aside. But we have had a long tradition of regulating politics as part of the First Amendment tradition. That's what makes election systems work. Um, and it is true in most other Western democracies as well. So I accept that part of the tradition. I think it's actually a necessary part of thinking about the way that we make the First Amendment work in, in the context of elections. So once you, make, once you accept that, then I think it's actually fine to regulate these organizations. Let me say thank you to all of you for attending this year's Bowdoin Lecture. Let me say that we will have a reception outside in the Zilber Forum. You are certainly welcome to join us out there, but let me especially say thank you to Heather Gurkin for a marvelous hour. Thank you very much.